Hello and welcome to my pre-recorded proof of Binet's formula and Cassini's identity. I'm going to try to lead you through how to not just prove these formulas and identities, but how you might go about deriving them, and my hope is that by the end of this demonstration you'll come out feeling like you might have come up with them by yourself. Firstly, we need to get acquainted with the problems, which is to find a formula for the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence, and prove some interesting identities about the Fibonacci sequence. So we obviously need to get acquainted with the Fibonacci numbers. This is the definition of the Fibonacci sequence. f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Or more understandably, every term is the sum of the previous two terms. Starting with f of 0 equals 0 and f of 1 equals 1, this produces the recognisable sequence you see on the screen. Now the first problem is to find a formula for the nth term in the sequence that doesn't take finding all the previous terms, as that could take a very long time. So let's try apply some problem solving. Firstly, let's compare to some sequences we've seen before, like an arithmetic sequence. To see if a sequence is arithmetic, we can find the difference between terms and see if it's constant, which sadly in this case it seems like it's clearly strictly increasing, as the difference is always the previous term. What about a geometric sequence? As we know, a geometric sequence will always produce numbers by a constant common ratio, so by dividing the next term by the previous, we should get a constant number. But sadly, that doesn't seem to be constant. Let's see what happens as we increase n anyway, and, as we can see, it converges on a number. Brownie points if you can see the number in the room you're sitting in right now. So what happens if we assume that the Fibonacci sequence is a geometric sequence? We know that the format of a geometric sequence is k to the n, so plugging that back into our definition of the Fibonacci sequence gives us this polynomial, which I want you to remember for later. As we know the Fibonacci numbers above n equals 0 are non-zero, we know k isn't 0, and we can divide both sides by k to the n minus 2, producing a quadratic which we can quickly solve with the quadratic formula to get two solutions. which we'll call phi and psi, explaining why the Fibonacci sequence doesn't have a perfect geometric sequence, as it's basically combining the two sequences. Now, there is a way to continue from here and produce a formula using some strange simultaneous equations, but even after studying this method for uh, quite a while, and originally using this proof in my presentation, I still don't really understand why you would do the step to reach this point. So I've opted for a less direct, but I think much clearer proof. Now, let's look at the polynomial I told you to tuck away earlier. This is called a characteristic polynomial, and is usually reserved for matrices, but in this case is quite useful in producing a formula for the Fibonacci sequence. We obviously know the terms for k to the 1 and k squared from earlier, but using the fact that the term for k to the n is the term for the previous one summed, we can add k to the 1 and k to the 2 together to get k to the 3, and as the terms collect, the coefficients combine and sum. Continuing this, we know that the coefficients of k will be the sum of the previous two coefficients, and the same for the constant term, which is the definition of for the Fibonacci sequence, with the constant term slightly shifted because of the k to the 1 term. Now, this is a very useful formula, because we know what the values of k are. Plugging these two values of k in, we get a pair of simultaneous equations which we subtract from one from the other to get an equation with f of n, and two known constants. We can then do some rearranging to get f of n in terms of phi and psi, and plugging their values back in, we can produce Binet's formula. For Cassini's identity, I must first prove to you an identity about matrices, which is quite general and you might find use in. This is the identity that the determinant of a matrix to the power of n is equal to the determinant of a matrix to the power of n. Intuitively, this makes sense as the determinant of a matrix basically describes what happens to areas of shape under a transform. 
and if you apply a transform n times, the shape's area will be multiplied by that determinant n times. However, if you want a concrete proof, here is an inductive proof. Now, to start with Cassini's identity, you might recognise that the Fibonacci sequence can be well defined by a transform. To put this in nice terms, if you take two terms of the Fibonacci sequence, you know the next term, and obviously the second of the original terms. To express this more generally, we get this transform, and this can be put into equation form and solved to find a matrix describing this transform, and therefore the Fibonacci sequence. Raising this to the power of n, or repeatedly applying it, depending on your perspective, produces a Fibonacci sequence given a set of two starting numbers. And just by luck, or in reality a mechanic I don't have time to explain, ignoring the two starting numbers produces this matrix, which can be proven by induction. So investigating this new matrix, we find that its determinant is f of n plus 1 times f of n minus 1 minus f of n squared, which is the left-hand side of Cassini's identity and is what we're interested in. Going back to the original matrix describing a Fibonacci transform, we can see that its determinant is minus 1, and using the identity I proved to you at the start, we can see that raising it to the power of n simply raises minus 1 to the power of n, and as we've shown that the matrices are equivalent, and as such so are their determinants, we've proven Cassini's identity.